everyone. Today um, I'm gonna talk about uh, the poem titled Poetry by Marianne Moore. This video is an analysis uh, to present the ideas and the structure and the devices that she has used in her poem. Some of the things that we have to think about the poet is that she was a 20th century poet and she was heavily influenced by the modern era. And we can also find some elements of romanticism in her poems. Uh, she's known to be very inventive, precise and witty. She's a poet and she's a critic and she's translator and she's editor. And um, she has been highly praised by well-known poets of that time. Um, for example, Ezra Pound, William Carlos Williams, T.S. Eliot, and etc. Moore has her own personal style, and that is syllabics. The tone of the poem is a very conversational and informal. Uh, for example, the very first line of the poem, I too dislike it, tells us that she is talking with somebody and she's agreeing to their viewpoint. Uh, it just gives the sense that uh, she has an audience that is also um, somebody who dislikes poetry and they make a statement and she's talking back and um, replying or you can say stating her own sense of mind that yes poetry is not always you know something that she is very passionate about but this very sense of uh, the first line of her dislike or uh, in the second line you can see the perfect contempt and this kind of hatred that she builds up in the beginning of the poem is just a way to attract the readers and keep them hooked in the poem. This is very deceptive. Um, she doesn't exactly mean this and we'll get to that later. And then the speaker, it is none other than Moore herself. Uh, the addressee are the readers of the poem and the form or the style is free verse. There is no rhymes or rhythms or meter or any kind of uh, structure or patterns that you can find in the, um, you know, the classical or the general type of poetry that is out there. So this is what it makes this poem uh, a modern one in nature. The point that Marianne Moore is trying to come across in this uh, poem is the differentiation or the distinction of uh, bad poetry um, and genuine poetry. She stated at the beginning that she dislikes poetry but in fact what she's really trying to say is that she does not like the bad poetry but she likes the genuine poetry bad poetry for marianne moore is useless or a fiddle in the very first line she says there are things that are important beyond all this fiddle Fiddle here means something nonsensical, meaningless, and that is the quality of bad poetry. The second uh, point that uh, Moore argues is, is that um, bad poetry is bad because it is derivative and is imitative in nature. Some of the poets, they copy from the great poets and they try to make it in their own version but that is just false it's not even a form of sowing some kind of intellect or originality that is 
important in poetry. In line eight, uh, she mentions like this. When they become so derivative as to become unintelligible. So derivative poems are changed in sort of way to um, like hide or disguise that they've been taken from somewhere else. But then in doing so, it becomes more unintelligible. It's like you cannot understand it and it does not show any kind of originality or intellect in that. And the third thing is that bad poetry is incomprehensible. It does not make any sense and you cannot understand that because it's so complex in nature and it has so many images that are just um, like forced together as makes our mind very confused about what is being tried to portray in the poem. To give examples of how some poems can be incomprehensible in nature and um, we cannot understand them and they're just some images that it does not resonate in our head is um, some of the animal imagery that Moore uses in the poem. Now let's look at that. The first animal imagery used in the poem is the bat. In line 11, it says, we cannot understand. And there's a colon. What Moore is trying to say here is that we cannot understand because of these reasons. And the reasons are given and, uh, after the colon. And so um, she says that the bat holding on upside down or in quest of something to eat. Now this image in our mind is something that is very um, unintelligible and something that we just cannot comprehend it. We can't understand like what's happening here or it's not something that we can relate to. It's not something that we can understand easily. This is very complex in nature. Similarly, when we look at the other animal imagery she uses, it's an elephant. And she says in line 13, elephants pushing. And now we don't know like why elephant is there, like what's the meaning behind that and pushing, I don't know what they're doing. It's just very, it's something that is just runs right above our head. Then the other image is of a horse. And now the horse in this poem is a wild horse taking a roll. It kind of gives this humorous imagination of like seeing a horse roll on the ground and uh, we're not sure like what's happening here like why is there a wild horse and why is it taking a roll and still we just can't understand this as well. Then the image of a wolf, a tireless wolf under a tree and we just uh, feel like okay there is a wolf and it's under a tree and it's tireless like what are these things that is uh, much uh, relevant in this picture is like we have no idea of that and so uh, those images are what makes bad poetry itself. Moore says that bad poetry is the product of half poets. In line 19 she says when dragged into prominence by half poets it is something uh, the poem itself is you know forced or dragged into the scene and those kind of uh, half poets who just use any kind of uh, way or means to make poetry are just uh, not sure of what they're doing and let's see this image here what can be half poets or who could be half poets 
half poets are those they uh, copy others and then they use complex languages complex images that we just saw earlier of those bats and elephants and horses and wolves and those images and they write about useless things of course that has nothing to do with the real life or some kind of meaning to the real life And uh, now let's look at what is exactly genuine poetry in Moore's view. The first thing she says is that genuine poetry is something useful. In line seven, um, high sounding interpretation can be put upon uh, them, but because they are useful. So she says that uh, it's not just because of the high sounding interpretation you can put in a poem that makes it genuine, but then the fact that it is useful is what makes it genuine. Then uh, the second thing is that, of course, genuine poetry is not something that is copied from others. It is beyond imitation. It is something very unique. It is original. It is creative. And um, the third thing is that comprehensible yeah, and it is simple, so simplicity. Uh, it's something we can understand easily. It is not at all kind of like a mix of jumbled words and jumbled images and all these things. And so right here we can get a little bit sense of her romantic influence. She really applauds poets who use um, creativity and, or, and originality and simplicity. And uh, the fourth uh, point that she argues is that genuine poetry is something that is produced by literalists of imagination. And um, this is a phrase that is used uh, by William Butler Gates when he talks about William Blake. And he uh, talked about uh, William Blake in such a way because um, he was actually trying to uh, make a criticism of William Blake. But here, Marianne Moore is using this in a positive sense. And we will uh, get to the meaning of the literalist of imagination letter in the video. There is definitely a uh, distinction between what can be considered as prose and what is considered as poetry. And uh, in line 16, she says, nor is it valid to discriminate against business documents and school books. All these phenomena are important. One must make a distinction However, when dragged into prominence by half poets, and the result is not poetry. So, uh, she says that, I mean, she does not mean to say that only poetry is something that is very important in life. Even there are other things like business documents and school books that are important. This reference is taken from Leo Tolstoy, who writes in his diary that poetry is verse, Poor prose is not verse, or else poetry is everything with the exception of business documents and school books. And so everything else is also relevant in life. And that's what Moore is trying to say. So one might wonder, what exactly is genuine poetry in a total sense? So there's this image that Marianne Moore uh, gives in her poem let's look at that so genuine poetry for more is nothing more than imaginary gardens with real thoughts in them this line 24 in the poem is one of the most popular line in this poem and uh, it is very poetic and it is very beautiful as we inspect closer, imaginary gardens with real thoughts in them. It's kind of, it sounds very impossible, but then with poetry, with the good 
writing that we can do and with our originality, our creativity, our simplicity, everything that we can use of the qualities that can make a genuine poetry, it is possible to have imaginary gardens with real thoughts in them. The gardens that we make up in our mind, a fictional place, can have the elements of reality. It can evoke senses to a human being when in, they read about our imaginary gardens and the toads in them. And this makes as a poetry very powerful and very uh, strong in evoking feelings and sentiments and emotions and everything it, to also come across with a certain message that we can apply in our real life. Genuine poetry is everything there is. We cannot distinguish it from a fiction and reality. The poetic devices used in the poem are irony, synecdoche, personification, enjambment, oxymoron, neologism. And um, when we look at uh, the part where she uses irony, it is the very first stanza. She says, I too dislike it. She does not mean what she says here. She says she dislikes poetry, but she doesn't really. She doesn't want to mean that. And she's also using poetry as a means to um, say that she dislikes poetry and it is very ironical indeed. Synecdoche is a device that is uh, like a whole of something that stands for its parts or the parts can stand for the whole of a something. And um, here, hands, eyes and hair, they stand for a human being. They represent a human being. And this is the kind of effect that poetry can have upon people. Um, the good kind of poetry, of course. And it can make the hands uh, grasp and eyes dilate and hair rise up. It's like an electrifying motion. It's like being shocked or japped. And it's like having goosebumps all over body. And that is the effect of genuine poetry. Personification is a device that is used to animate an inanimate object. It is giving the human qualities into uh, things that are not human or objects that cannot operate as a human can. So here in the first stanza, um, it says, hair that can rise if it must. So hair here has a kind of volition. It has the ability, it has the will, willingness or its own um, mind of whether it can, uh, whether it wants to rise or it doesn't want to rise, whether it must rise and it must not rise. And it has the kind of uh, way that it can operate on its own. And it, this is uh, a use of per personification right here because hair in itself does not do anything in, in the real world. It does not have the motion or volition that is presented here in the poem. And um, the next thing is the enjambment. Enjambment is a technique used in poem that is uh, the run on line. When a stanza ends, it does not end with a specific uh, punctuation mark or anything. It runs on to the next stanza, even though there is a line break in between. So the examples are that in line six, the stanza ends with, 
if it must these things are important not because uh and there's a line break and then in the na next stanza it starts with high sounding interpretation can be put upon them because so uh, the uh, line that is uh, on the sixth is connected with the line that is on the seventh so even though there's a line break in between we have to read them together it's like a run on line and that is enjambment and you can see other examples uh, throughout the poem at the end of every stanza and next literary device or poetic device is oxymoron in line 20 um, you see that literalist of the imagination this phrase is very contradictory in nature an oxymoron is something that is contradictory here literalist of the imagination now what does literalist mean literalist itself means like being a realist portraying something that is literal that is just the way it is uh, without any kind of exaggeration or uh, fictionalized version and imagination stands for things that we think about things that we imagine in our heads things that are not true so now uh, they she means marian moore here means to say that uh, genuine poetry can only be created when the poets themselves are literalists of the imagination. So the poet poets have to have the capacity of capacity of being both literalist and having imagination. And now that is kind of contradictory. Like how can you be uh, factual? How can you be realist? And how can you? Uh, just talk about what is probable and what is real and at the same time mix imagination on that and so it's kind of contradictory and um, the word literalist is itself a neologism that is a, a word that is not in the dictionary but then it was coined and it is a combination of two words that is literal and realist in conclusion the poets must create a world using their imagination to write genuine poetry and then the poets need to have this uh, ability to render the abstract into concrete just like the imaginary garden with real toads and the raw material that is talked about in the final stanza of the poem is nothing other than imagination itself and then genuine writing is both about imagination and reality and if one considers all these things then in Moore's idea or Moore's thinking you are interested in poetry and that's how she ends the poem Thank you for watching the video and I hope that it was very useful to you. I'll see you again in the next video.